All right. Ready? Ready. Good day, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Hazmat Guys. I'm Bobby Salveson, so let's get into it. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to episode 30. Let me do that again. Yep. I think, uh, I think, yeah, last week's, I'm punching, I'm blowing through my uh, my levels. I think that's where the problem was. All right. All right. <clears throat> welcome back, everybody. This is episode 39, and you are listening to the premier podcast dealing with hazardous materials response for the fire responder, where we're going to give you the knowledge and the insight to do your job safely and effectively. I'm Michael Monaco. I am always glad to be here with my co-host, Bob Salverson. Good What's morning. Up, Bob? Nothing. Good morning. How are you? Good. <laughs> I, I, uh, I have a really, just because I was, I was doing that little intro, and uh, I have an apology to make out oh. there and a, a little correction to do. What's that? So I have a buddy of mine, uh, Randy Nelson, uh, who lives down the block from me, and he works for a company called Miller Environmental. So I'm outside with uh, with my Marine friend, Paul Stout, and uh, he, he drives up and he's like, I got a bone to pick with you about the show. He listens to the show, loves the show. And he goes, uh, there was an episode that you talked about that we are it, like the fire department is it like there's nobody coming afterwards and he's like uh what about me uh, i come afterwards i was like he's like i had the, he's like there's a whole business set up for people that come afterwards i'm like you know you're absolutely 100% right i'm so sorry like we just think fire response and for a responders point of view there's nothing out there huh. and uh, he's I like or like well when there's nobody going to get hurt when he shows up right right but there are, you know, people yeah. out there that 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 will take it another step further or go above and beyond, you know, once that immediate life threat is over. And I just want to give a quick shout out to them because sometimes we forget that there's more than just firefighters listening to the show. We've got people in industry, and uh, we we cannot leave them out. So, uh, Randy, I'm 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 very sorry. There's my apology. We welcome him, Randy. You know what? You can start the trend and get some cool shirts and mugs and start that swag <laughs> closet and get and, those guys at Miller really looking good. And Bob, where would he be going for this <laughs> swag? You can go to the hazmatguys.com slash store and uh, pick up all that he needs in every size and shape. It is not a shameless plug if we are doing it for our own website. Yes. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> what else? Oh, well, we've got the uh, couple upcoming speaking engagements, one in particular in, uh, what is that going to be, in October? No, September, September 18 through 22. We're going up to Massachusetts. Yeah, Massachusetts Convention. We're going to be uh, talking quite a bit. We've got uh, both of our lectures we were asked to go and do up there. So if you're in the area, feel free to uh, buy a ticket and, and come see us. Uh, support the show, support the conference and uh, see what it's all about. And uh, I just like to talk about the round table. We just, we literally just finished up an episode of that uh, about 15 minutes ago. And we just transitioned right into this and we do a weekly uh, round table conversation with the guy from, uh, he's a Lieutenant from uh, Orlando fire department and a captain from uh, like the LA area fire department. And all we do is uh, dissect news articles and stuff and put our, own little spins on it and it's a pretty good idea and if you're listening to this on the podcast version where we just started doing this in the video version as well so we are doing this live with the bloopers and outtakes that i usually edit out for the podcast is live and in there so if you just go to uh google plus right is it google it's google plus it's google plus yeah and then you just uh, plus one the hazmat guys uh, you, you, it's very easy to find us and then you'll be notified anytime we start a new live show. If you get to watch it live, great. If not, they will be on YouTube for all eternity. Hopefully. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Hopefully they don't, they, they, didn't, they don't get taken down for like nudity or something. Yeah. Until Skynet takes it over. <laughs> uh, and th that plus one, that's kind of like the Google version of liking the show, right? Like you kind of like it and you follow it, something like that. So, um, yeah, I know nobody uses Google Plus, but I'm sure one day we all will uh, once they 
buy out Facebook and then awesome. eliminate it. <laughs> uh, so I'm trying to think, is there any, uh, anything else that we got to kind of talk about before the show? Oh, I think we just got to give them what the topic is. I think that's a good start. Oh, they have no idea what we're talking about today. That's right. Uh, we're all right. So we get, we're on a couple of different forums, uh, Facebook, we're on a couple of different pages that deal with hazmat. And there seems to always be this kind of question of, of PPE. And even today, uh, one of my forums that I'm on, somebody posed the question, Hey, we had a sulfuric acid spill in a street. Um, you know, do you guys, what do you guys think about Tyvex? Level A. Go right to level A. <laughs> level Z. I do it naked. <laughs> um, so, and it's not that the people on these sites, you know, don't get me wrong. It's not that these people don't know how to pick their PVE, but, you know, there's, there's this constant feeling like maybe – Maybe I'm being second guessed. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. Let me go out and get other people's opinions, which is a fantastic thing to do because uh, the more opinions you can have, the better of an informed choice that you can make. So we're going to be talking about PPE today, uh, what our choices are, how we're going to turn around and select it, and uh, the pluses why? and the minuses. And why? Uh, you know, because it's that that has got to be what you just said, it, like the second guessing. And I. I still second guess, but luckily we got that thing that we like to call the hazmat huddle where before we're going to do anything, there's four or five, six, seven guys that get their heads together that all know kind of the deal. And we look at the, the NIOSH and all the other stuff. And we say, well, based upon this and utilizing a healthy dosage of, uh, of common sense, where, what are we doing? Right. Right. So, yeah. So. And it's, it's one of those really strange things. Um, and this ties into, I just want to touch on this, this real quick, because we got an email a couple of weeks ago and, uh, there was a guy and he was looking for SOPs and, um, he was having a really hard time finding SOPs, you know, GOPs, SOPs. He was looking, talking to different teams and cross counties and things like that. He reached out to us and, uh, I basically, I think I gave him the answer that pretty much everybody else is, is that. There are so many different variables that happen within a hazmat response and a hazmat run that to have an SOP could, from a liability point of view, really limit you uh, because you there could be one little change from the scenario set forth in the SOP and you can't follow that SOP, right. but now you have to justify not following that SOP. And PPE definitely lands within that that structure of or lack of structure where, you know, you do one thing with one chemical and then some variable changes and now you have to do something completely different. So just for that same chemical, I mean, it could be just some type of environmental change or the slope of the ground or it could be anything. Anything. So there's an innumerable amount of different variations. It's not like a fire where we know the heat's going to go up. We know the smoke's going to bank down. You know, we kind of know, basically, I don't want to, you know, uh, oversimplify fires, but you basically know what's going to go down. You know, it, it's going to get hotter. It's going to grow every 30 seconds. It's going to double in size and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in hazmat, there's way, way, way too many variables. So that is one of the daunting tasks of picking your proper PPE is how many variables there is. It's not like I can say, well, you're going to do this, if this, then that. And, uh, and we're going to try to shed a little light on this, really kind of taking you through the basics of, of the suits and then getting into really uh, four scenarios that we selected that are current. I mean, they're real deal type things that we've actually had. Yeah, common, common stuff. And we're going to touch on, when we go through the scenarios, we're going to touch on chemical physical properties uh, and understanding chemical physical properties, but then also uh, understanding what your meters could be telling you about the chemical and and taking all of it and mushing it together and then coming together with a decision all right so what so else what i guess got? without i guess without further ado let's uh i guess we can't really talk about ppe without talking about the suits and the the various levels all right so first one we have i, I mean we can get into the level d station where 
you know, the the uniform, which I believe is what uh, steel toed shoes, long pants, uh, long sleeve shirt, you, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, more yeah. mechanical protection than yeah. anything else. It's friction and it's, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. So we're not even going to talk about in this in this whole show. What we're talking about is uh, the basis of our chemical protection, what we would actually done on the street to take care of something. So the first one's going to be a level C, and this is the lowest level of protection that we have. It consists of like a, a chemical protective clothing for splash uh, dusts, you know, and I don't mean to degrade what's actually out there, but this, in my mind, whenever I think of a, a, a level C, I'm thinking of uh, that Home Depot dust suit, you know, like the zip up dust suit thing. Right, right. The white, the white suit. But right. uh, it, it really can be, it could have chemical protection to it. You know, like it, it, it doesn't have to be that that kind of paper suit that that is used for for painters. It could be an an actual chemical protective suit with a, a hood and everything. Um, we're really just looking at that, and then we're combining it with some kind of respiratory protection. Right, like the N95, which is like the uh, the duckbill kind of um, dust filter thing that you use for spackling and sanding. Uh, the APR, which is the air purifying respirator, or the PAPR, which is the powered air purifying respirator. Right. Uh, level B. Would go ahead and be our next level up. I, I'll say level up, not that one's better than the other, uh, but level B is going to offer a little bit uh, more protection. And when we get into level B, there's going to be two types of, of suits that we're going to talk about. All right. So level B consists of the chemical protective clothing and full SCBA. Now, the C we were talking about before is utilizing the APR, the PAPR, the N95, some type of respiratory protection, which is, again, uh, can be chemical through that filter, but it's, uh, I think it's more of a dust and vapor. I don't want to say vapor. That's probably the wrong wording. Well, you could. I mean, those, those APR canisters, those Cap 1 filters, they technically can do some vapors. Maybe you missed. That's what I'm thinking. About, like large kind of spritz. Right. <laughs> spritz. What exactly would be defined as a spritz? I don't know. Just like, I don't know. Like it's like, like where you spray a cat that's being, or a dog or something. I don't know. <laughs> a mist coming off a, an ocean breeze. Yes. So Ooh. poetic, Bob. <laughs> So we're not we're not talking about APRs. We're not talking about Pappers on this ride, okay? We are talking about grade A, high quality, premium compressed air. Wow, that is a lot of enthusiasm over air. Yeah, well, air, air is like sex. <laughs> what? How is it? How is it like sex? Well, it's it's not really a big deal until you're not getting any. Oh my god! Well, it is free, right? So uh, free is for me. So you said we were taking this and we're going to be breaking it into two parts. What do you mean by that? All right. So the level B, remember the, the definition is chemical protective clothing, the loose definition, not the standard, you know, 40 word crappy definition, uh, but the a loose definition, chemical protective clothing, SCBA. It doesn't specify whether that's, you know, a hooded B where you're, you're wearing your SCBA on the outside or whether it's the encapsulated B where it's in the suit. Right. And then the encapsulated, if you didn't, if you looked at it quickly, the encapsulated B really looks like a level A. It really looks like a level A, uh, you know, but the SCBA is on the outside versus the SCBA is on the inside and the level A. So quickly, you wouldn't know the difference. No. Right. No. So, I mean, the normal is, uh, you know, again, the SCB is on the outside. The face piece is taped to the hood, and this helps to keep the splash away. Again, if you're getting, if you're wearing a hooded, which is kind of like, you know, you put your hoodie up over your, your head, um, the splash can go inside. And that's when we're going to switch over to that and hole encapsulated with the, the face piece in it. And the way I was taught is that if it's a liquid leak, and the liquid leak is above your nipple line, you switch over to an encapsulated. And if it's below, you switch over to a hooded. And the reason is because you don't want to be working with it going down your neckline. We, we put it on for a reason. You put it on the proper one. That's why we have two options. 
Right. Plus, you want to protect your SCBA uh, if you know if necessary. If you have some kind of a, a an acid or something like that, you want to protect your your SCBA from splash. You would go ahead and and put the encapsulated on, and and the SCBA essentially sits inside the suit. I'm gonna mock that. I don't know about that. Why? Because the Bs are all outside. A's are the only one inside. No. The encapsulated? Yeah, the you're encapsulated. You're fully inside. Holy shit, you're right. I'm totally blanked on that. I'm sorry. You're right. It's okay. Okay. All right, I'm walking it. Here we go. And then you got the level A, right? Yeah, this is going to be the top dog of the chemical protection world. We're talking fully encapsulated, vapor tight, full SCBA. Wow. I hope uh, that the full SCBA won't last long in full, inside this puppy without an air source because if you do not wear an SCBA uh, because it is vapor tight, you're literally cut off from the outside world. You're bringing your your entire environment in with you. Like when we had the fire, uh, when, when you go into a fire, I love the news that says the firefighters were wearing their oxygen tanks. No, no. we're wearing, you know, uh, compressed air. It's dehumidified compressed air. Well, when we get into the suit, we're not just bringing air in with us. We are literally taking in our entire environment from our toes to our tops of our heads in with us. So we did a little experiment uh, way back, uh, I'm going to say maybe 10 years ago in, in, in the firehouse where we went into a level A, a couple of us, and we tested. We One guy went in there with a five gas meter, and we wanted to see how – things affected him when he did not have it because we were we at that point we were talking about oh well if we have to get out of the level a real quick we're just going to cut ourselves out and you know we'll roll the dice with whatever we're we're exposed to on the outside of it and there were guys who were saying well i think you have a couple of minutes afterwards so we did one experiment with a guy where he got in fresh and had no uh scba on and then we did another one where the guy had the SCBA on and he was operating inside it for maybe five, 10 minutes and then took it off. And once the air got down to around 16% oxygen, the guy started getting really loopy. Like he was starting to get giddy. giddy. He was giddy and he was starting to make jokes. And we're like, this guy's not a very funny guy, but all of a sudden he's he's a clown. Right. We need to cut off his oxygen supply. Make yeah, it interesting. We <laughs> so we took the tourniquet off his neck. And no, I'm joking. We didn't do that. We We just opened the suit up and he said, when he got out that, you know, his vision started narrowing like it tunneled up and uh, he started hearing ringing in his ears and he couldn't stop laughing. It was so what we're saying is that when you're in this, uh, these suits, if your SCBA malfunctions, something that there's really no timeout button, there's no redos. So you better make sure it works before you get into this and zip this thing up. Right. Yeah. And don't think that, oh, I've got all this air to breathe because in reality, Think about what's happening when you're inside that suit, right? You're, you're fully encapsulated. Yes, you, when you first zipper that suit up, you have a full 21% oxygen in the suit. But now you're starting to work. You're starting to operate. You're exhaling into the suit. You only exhale about 16% oxygen. So now all of a sudden, you decide, hey, or not decide, but something happens with that SCBA. You turn around, you rip that face piece off. Now you're starting at 16% oxygen. Exactly. And and you're going to rapidly decrease from there. So uh, really, really important to train on these suits. And you got to have very, very, very high confidence with your with your SCBA that you know it's going to work. Because it, even in a fire, you could take your SCBA off and get low to the ground and, and get out. But you don't have that much time in a level A if you got to rip your face piece off. Right. And even the claustrophobia effect of it, because if a guy gets into an SCBA, just an SCBA, and he has a little bit of that, oh boy, it's getting tight in here. Well, put on a suit and your SCBA. And oh, then yeah. you're nothing, you can't see nothing. You have no feeling. You know, that sense of feeling and the sense of sound that you almost get amplified because you can't taste or, you know, smell or anything like that, they're all gone. So you really have nothing when you're right. in that suit. You you lose total sense of your surroundings as well, like outside the suit. Right. Like there's this weird kind of buffered from the environment. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later too, about the problems of losing all your senses. Right. Which is what happened to us right before we start each show. Uh, 
So what are the limitations of each one of these suits? Let's talk about these a little bit. It's good to know when you want to use it and what the limitations are. So let's start off with a level C. Uh, we're going to really choose a level C. It's going to be the best when we're just kind of worried about keeping ourselves clean. Right. And I am cleaning up. If I'm cleaning up diesel, let's say, on a cold day, then I'm really not too concerned about breathing in the vapors. My main concern is just I don't want to get my bunker gear dirty. I don't want to get my shoes dirty. So I might utilize like a, a hooded bee. Um, maybe I, yeah, I've done this, and it's probably not the proper donning procedure, but if I have like a messy oil slick on the ground, I might put on my hooded bee or even like a uh, – some type of ensemble that's equivalent to that and just tie it around my waist because I'm just really worried about getting my everything from the waist down dirty with this oil that's everywhere. Right. Absolutely. Um, it, your concern is focused on the cleanup. You're not really concerned about the vapor pressure. You're not really looking at something that's very toxic. Right. And you can have little to no respiratory protection in this type. You know, we again, going back to that diesel, the, uh, the the oil leak that's on the ground, we don't have to worry about that. There are, if you have a concern for respiratory protection, then you have to recheck your your selection, I guess it would be. Yeah, you need to consider bumping it up to a B. All right. Uh, this is used a lot in decon. Since a lot of the entries are done in Bs, then Cs is perfect for decon, right? We always want to be that one level below if not at the level one level below um we're not really expecting to get a lot of product on us when we decon right we're washing these guys down we're at a little bit of, of a distance we're we're scrubbing them this is really you're wearing the sea as a just in case just in case you get something splashed on you just in case you you get your brush up against the person or or come in contact with a tool something along those lines all right so then what are some of the limitations of the suit well for one uh, we have absolutely no way of being able to use the suit if there's not enough oxygen in the air. You're talking about using. Uh, you're talking about the the percentage of oxygen in the air. It's got to be stable and usable for us to use it. So, what about using like a PAPR or an APR? Can we do nope. that? Nope, because you still need the O2 in the atmosphere to use them. Remember, the APRs and the filters and the PAPRs are literally just that. They are just a filtering type of respiratory protection. Um, they'll take out the chemicals, but they're not adding oxygen back into the system. So, um, you know, does. It does nothing to give you that O2. How about concentration? Does that have any effect? Yeah, you shouldn't use the filter type respiratory protection if we are above, again, that IDLH, which is the immediately dangerous to life and health of the product that we're working with. It's contraindicated for the standard. Right. Now, we talk about this. We talk to other people. And some people feel that these suits have a real limited chemical protection. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I yeah, I, I disagree with it. These suits now are really good at chemical protection. Um, there is new ones. We, me and Mike just uh, tried out at the recent Baltimore show in 2016. And uh, they are unbelievably lightweight uh almost transparent i gotta say it kind of gave you the illusion that it was transparent and you can you can see you can take a look at that the c suits that we use the tie chem s and the the chemical compatibility bleh, the chemical compatibility and it's fairly impressive you know in, in our in our case a lot of these chemical compatibilities are are um up in the range of a higher level but the abrasion resistance was the limiting factor, and that's why it was actually kicked down one level. Right. We, I'm telling you, when I first got into hazmat, the the level C stuff that we wore, it was like it was rain gear. I mean, literally, I, I, when they got rid of it, people took it as rain gear. <laughs> it's, it's no different than rain gear. Um, I guess it had some chemical protective to, you know, qualify as chemical protective clothing, but it's come so far. You, we use uh Thai chem F not to, you know, to, to push one brand or another, just kind of what we use. And in each one of those is what Bob was saying, the chemical compatibility, you open it up and it's just as long as an, an impressive as any level a that's out there. 
Right. The difference is going to be that res uh, that that abrasion resistance. Right. And then just that respiratory protection. So let's bump up the respiratory protection a little. Let's talk about the bees. All right. Birds Any time. What's up? The birds and the bees. The birds and the bees. No, don't do that. Uh, anytime we want to use bees, all right, we want to do the splash protection of C, but now we want to protect our lungs from whatever's in the air. Right. So two, uh, you know, all right. So the two time that the C and so. I'm going to mark know what that, what that Yeah, is. I marked it. So two times. Oh, that's probably supposed to be few. So the no, that wouldn't make sense anyway. Oh, two times because of the. Oh, I got it. Two times because of the the encapsulated and the hooded. B can't be used. It's B. Okay, now I got it. Okay, I'm starting. All right, so then the two times that the C ensemble can't be used is the B the perfect choice, Mike? Yeah, so this is exactly what it's meant for, low oxygen or any time you have a chemical above the ideal H. All right, what about the unknown? The, the, oh, like <laughs> the unknown. It up my spine when you said that. Yeah, the, the elusive unknown, right? So are we going in protective equipment or are we going in bunker gear? And uh, there's a few things that we need to establish first. Okay, like are we stepping into a corrosive atmosphere? You got to key up in that word, corrosive. That's a big deal. Oh, yeah. that To walk into a corrosive atmosphere is definitely a big no-no. But it's not much different than uh, walking into a flammable atmosphere, right? Yep, that would be bad too. We'd use bunker gear for that. And I just like to say this, that if we have that, that, that type of scenario where we have – both a flammable and a toxic, that's where people get really dicey with this because they're like, well, what do I put on? If I wear my, let's say, level A, level B, whatever you pick, and it's a flammable, well, I might get sausage wrapped in this and shrink wrapped in my plastic suit. Should, I should wear a bunker. Yeah. Oh, but I should put my bunker gear in. But my bunker gear is not rated for anything that's chemical. So what do I do? That's the problem. So in really what we what we got to do is you're going to have to change the environment in some way. What do you mean? Uh, well, I'm saying we're going to have to either ventilate positive. Well, I'm going to say positively pressurized or we're going to ventilate this thing in some way to change the atmosphere. So that either one or the other is hospitable for us. So either I'm going to try to intentionally drop the toxicity to the point where I can make entry um, successfully. Or I'm going to drop the flammability in the room enough so that I limit the area that would be impinged by flame. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. That, know, that... Instead of the whole room going on fire, I'm going to try to limit it to like a foot away from the product. Right. And then you would just keep your monitors, your meters nearby. You are. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, somebody is. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not doing it. Hopefully. But, uh, and you want to keep a listen out for that that audible alarm. Hey, you're re-entering the, the flammable atmosphere. Right. That's why we have the alarms. Use them. All right. So the B is essentially the same as the A, but with the SCBA, we're bringing in our own air because we all know about air. Right. <laughs> yes. I think we all remember about the air. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> uh, we mentioned before about the encapsulating B. Should we dive a little into that? Yeah. So the encapsulating B... We're going to put it on as if we are really going to get splashed. I'm talking like total deluge, like uh, uh, what was that? The flash dance, right? Where she's dancing with the, the gasoline. Or the, I, I uh, have no idea what you're talking about. Back in the 80s, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember stuff I saw last week. All right, forget it. <laughs> but I'm sure there is a, a listener out there who just saw flash dance and will know the reference. Yes. If you do, contact us at... <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the regular B protects against the splash. So when I say regular B, I mean that that hooded B. Uh, but the encapsulated B is if you're going to be like playing in the sprinklers. All right. The chemicals are shooting out from all directions, shit spraying everywhere. It, right. It's just craziness. 
yeah, and it doesn't really have to be that bad to choose encapsulating. If you know for sure you're going to get wet, then throw it on and protect the SCBA and, and, and yourself. It's only going to make the decontamination easier for everybody down the road. And it doesn't matter. Like just you have a choice of two ensembles that are basically the same thing. One keeps you almost totally clean and one doesn't. So if you're going to use the one that doesn't pretty make pretty sure that you're not going to get all that dirty because if you get that dirty and your SCBA is that exposed, they might have to permanently decommission and, and uh, throw that SCBA out. Yeah. That expensive. That, yeah. That's so, yeah. I mean, for us, Jesus, they've got, you know, millions of dollars of them, right. but uh, it's uh, it's a little bit more clumsy to work in uh, because you're kind of dealing with that, you know, that separated from your environment. So just kind of be ready for that. Right. Where are we? Uh, here. Gotcha. I lost you there. Sorry. So you actually did it. You did uh, two of them. Sorry. It's okay. So you just finished. It's a little more clumsy to work. Yep. Yeah. And it's hot and steamy. So I like to just, you know, right beforehand, I like to go to White Castle, load up. <laughs> and the guy that opens up the back zipper always gets, I like to call it the, uh, the zipper full of smiles. Yes. Everybody. Oh. Gets a little bit of love wafting up to your Donner, Doffer. Doffer. What would you call that person? A Doffer? I don't understand why they D. I think they. I've heard them as tenders. I'm not quite sure if I like the word tender. Well, either way, it, it is. Sounds soft and supple. It's going to be very hot and steamy in there. So figure out a way to wipe down the shield on the inside. A lot of these newer ones, they have like I've seen them where they have add-on. Um, I want to say like screen protectors. And when you're inside, you if it gets all steamy and uh, you know you can't see through it, you peel off a layer like an onion and it's fresh and clean again. And it has like a, a film on it that, that keeps it from going, but eventually it goes away and then you peel off the next one. And it has like five or six of them. I thought it was a pretty, uh, pretty good idea. Do you remember back when we had the piranhas in the kitchen? Yes, I do. Okay. I do you remember the little device that they that we had to clean the fish tank? Yeah, it was like a, a magnet on the outside and a, a pad with a magnet on the inside, and you could clean the inside of the fish tank yes. from the outside. Brilliant. Why, why, why can't we do something like that? Okay, nobody heard that. We're going to put that. Forget that. We're, all right, we'll talk about that off air. Sorry, just a random thought. Um, <laughs> so let's put the fish aside. Yes, we used to have piranhas um let's dive into the the level a okay all right because this is one that i think people used a lot when hazmat was first kind of starting out and now it's very rarely if ever used um so if you're if your department's using it a lot you mean maybe that may need to either take a step back and reevaluate how you pick your ppe or you need to move because you've got a lot of bad stuff happening in your area on a regular basis. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm going to throw this, sh this suit on when I know, when I know that I have a chemical in the air, that's going to reach out, touch me and do some damage. Right. And this is the hands down best level of protection we have out there besides our heads and our thoughts. Oh man, I got some damaged tools up here. <laughs> um, all right. So let me question you on that a little bit because you we just said it's the best level of protection then why don't we just say screw it with you know screw the other three throw them out the window and just use the level a all the time i mean it's 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 the it provides you the ultimate level of protection where you know nothing is going to happen well because it's 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 the best suit when you need to be protected from vapors it's it's not the best suit. There's goods and bads with each one of these suits. And this one is you're putting yourself at a lot of risk. Like we said before, when you go into this suit, you've lost most of your vision, a lot of your hearing, 
a lot of your dexterity and your tactile touch. You've already lost your your smell and your taste because it's inside of your uh, SCBA. So you're really capping everything you have. And then you get those slip, trips, and falls, which is the, uh, the most common place, you know, workplace uh, problems and, and, and injuries. This really, this suit compounds it. So if you're going to put this on, you should have a reason. Right, because you have risk of falling, you right. have risk of overheating, yep. you have really a risk of running out of air because, you know, we think as firefighters, all right, my vibrant alert's going to go off and I'm going to start to leave. Right. Well, if you wait for your vibrant alert to go off in your level A, you're screwed right. because the amount of time it's going to take you to, to get to decon, go through decon, get undressed because that face piece is the last thing that you're going to take off. So running out of air is a real, is a real possibility. Uh, also, the increased stress on your body. You know, if you're, if it's not something that you're used to, man, especially in the summertime, it you take a beating in a level A. Right. These things are not easy to work in. Even if you're in very good shape, you shouldn't just put them on for no reason. You really need to do a risk benefit. Uh, analysis kind of thing and, and and determine if this physical danger of putting it on and operating in a level a suit is worth the damage that might be done at the chemical uh if from the chemical if you do not put on the suit you got to kind of put it on the scale right so what you're kind of saying is if the chemical can get into the air and can't hurt you leave the level a on a rig use a level b right yeah it, it it really, it's it, it's a thing that as we've start to learn more about chemical physical properties and pathophysiology, we're starting to leave that level A away more yeah. and more often. All right, and now we're going to go into respiratory protection. So, first thing, respiratory protection I think of is SCBA. And since respiratory protection seems to play such a large role in the choice of PPE, we thought it's important to go through the choices really quick just to get the down and dirty. Yeah, well, SCBA, hands down, best bet for respiratory protection. Yeah, I, on the protection scale, it goes from 1 to 10,000. SCBA is 10,000. It's the best. You can't it's the it. best. Why 10,000? Why not make it 100? Do you have any idea how they came up with that 10,000 number? I think it's the same reason why ERG guide 111 is the uh, first guide. It should be number one. It should be number one because the other increments are all in even hundreds. I don't know. Somebody, what somebody else? explain. It. If you know why they use 10,000, please reach out to us because I I'd like to know. Why like the AHA has to change their CPR guidelines every year. I think this is so that somebody has a job penciling changes. Periodically. Well, yeah, because they, they, uh, somebody, the publisher needs a new book to I be see. bought and sold. So you can't do that if everything stays the same. Which you can um, find the hazmat guys. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> right. Go to our affiliate link. <laughs> anyway. Oh, yeah. And it's not just hazmat. We get to use our SCBA, and we're very comfortable with our SCBA in all sorts of environments, whether it's a high IDLH, a low oxygen, high oxygen, flammability. It's really it's the best choice all around. Yeah, but we're, we're only when we're talking about protecting the lungs. See, there's other things to consider. Like what? Like how long you're going to wear it? Like oh, how? That's true. Let, let's say we, we let's take decon for example. You might be doing this for hours. Do you really want to don and doff your PPE just to change a cylinder every time? Or even how about standing around for a ton of time? We've done that. Hurry up and get ready. Hurry up and wait. Hurry up and wait. Everybody's waiting around to do nothing because we got to hurry up to get there. All right. So that's a good point. You know, great respiratory protection, but definitely has its downfalls. Right. Um, so then what about the APR? All right. What's uh, what's the skinny on that? For the most part, it's some type of, you know, and it's like little magical pixies and smatterings of magic. There's fairy dust in yes. there. No, there's, there's not. There's just unicorn. No, there's no unicorn. It's carbon filter. That allows us to breathe the atmospheric air, but it has been cleaned up through many layers of uh, either like, um, I'm going to say layers of like fiber, fiber layers, I guess. And and this carbon, uh, carbon filters that are in there. Uh, I don't really know very much about them. I know they work. 
Yeah, they, they do work. And they're great. Most firefighters, all right, um, they know these as things that snap onto their face pieces. I don't think a lot of departments have like an individual APR face mask thing that's going on. Most of them just snap right onto the face piece, right? Yeah, and we, we've, we've used these things at long-term operations. They are lightweight. They last for hours. However, I will caution you that they do take their tolls on your chest muscles, like the intercostals, which help expand and contract your chest cavity to help you breathe with the diaphragm. They beat them up pretty good. Uh, you get tired. It's surprising. And when, you, when it happens, it's very uncomfortable because you're not used to having to pull for air. The PAPR, a lot better, but again, it's it's only good for so long. I mean, how much can you take? Yeah, and there's limitations to where you can and can't go with these. Um, you need full O2 because, like we said before, there's not oxygen being fed into the system. And that chemical concentration, it has to be below the ideal H. Otherwise, the filtration is no good. You're going to overload it, and you're going to end up breathing the stuff in. Right. And you can see on an SCBA, the moment that the regulator feels like that negative pressure, you know, it gives you that blast to your face, uh, you know, with the air, making breathing feel effortless. Uh, I always laugh when I went through Proby school or whatever it is, or I'm sure just about every SCBA manufacturer has this, they have that purge valve. And uh, I remember back when I came in, they said, listen, if you can't get enough air, just crack that open and give yourself a little extra. But as I got a little on in, in my time, I started questioning that. Why would I give myself air? Because if I hold my breath and I turn that on, all I'm doing is dumping the air to the outside. So that system, because it's positive pressure, no matter how hard you try to outbreathe that mask, it will always bury you with the amount of air it can give to you. Yeah, you yeah, can yeah, never yeah. outbreathe it. Nope. So why give the air to the atmosphere? Hold yeah, you, it. You're going to lose it anyway. I mean, geez, you move your jaw the wrong way and it pisses out air. Yeah. So, I mean, just so you know, the SCBA, it's going to help you breathe. It's very comfortable to breathe. The APR, it gets very difficult. The lungs and all muscles, uh, muscles and all lungs, the, it's, it gets difficult. The PAPR helps out a little bit, but it's not perfect. Right. So let's talk about that PAPR a little bit. All right. We've got, uh, we've got the APR. The PAPR is really just an adapted APR with a, almost like a, a mechanical fan in it that pushes the air through the filter and then blows it in your face. Right. And again, it has it has basically, uh, depending on what model you have, it has one cartridge or two cartridges. The ones that me and Mike use have two cartridges. I don't know if that makes it any better or worse. I guess it just doubles your length that you can be in there. But uh, it does a pretty good job, it, but it's a backpack. And now you're, you're reduced, you're, you're increasing the thickness of your body. Uh, and it's another thing you have to carry and worry about. What if the battery goes out? What if this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Well, it, you know, the, we do get that question a lot. What if the battery runs out? You can just, you can breathe through the filters, but then it just becomes as hard to breathe it as the APR, but it, you're not going to die. Right. But it, you know, because you have two filters, it's half the resistance on each. So that's true. That's bad, man. I'm joking. <laughs> that is bad, man. You double <laughs> the fraction in the two, smart, and five by two, and you're at one. And God damn right. it, I hate math. <laughs> so what do we got now? This is the fun part. I like this. All right. So, you know, let's we're going to chat a little bit about fire gear versus chemical protective clothing or, or chemical gear. Um, and this is really going to kind of be focused. This is a conversation we have a lot with our operations level guys, because the operations level guys are, are the ones that are going to be doing stuff in their fire gear. And they're always like, well, how can I do anything? If you just told me that, that the, my bunker gear provides me no chemical protection whatsoever. Right. And then they see us doing what we told them not to do with the same gear that they have. And they say, they go, well, why is it okay for you to, right. well, because of the thousands of hours of training that we have to understand why we can, and why you can't. Right. And we kind of have different um, goals when we're on scene, right? So the goal of an operations level guy is to be defensive, defensive operations. And one of the biggest defensive operations is life safety. So we try to, to really get across to everyone. We don't have time to sit and, and go through the numbers and the math here. 
Um, but if you're wearing fire gear and you got to go in and make a rescue and pull somebody out, you're going to be exposed to that chemical for such a short period of time that even though the gear is not going to provide, you know, quote unquote, chemical protection, it is going to keep that chemical off your skin long enough to go in, grab somebody, pull them out, and then you take your gear off. Yep. Effective. Right? Yeah, you're going to save a life. Yeah, you got to do what you got to do. Whereas we are very much about getting into the product, getting saturated with the product, and doing something to mitigate the problem. Well, hopefully not. That's uh, my job is to not get saturated with the product unless I absolutely, in order to mitigate the issue, I'm trying to stay as clean as possible. That's my number one thing. Right. Yeah. We never want to, you know, be splashing in it without without a reason. Quick, you know. Right. <laughs> Just playing in sulfuric acid. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm really nilly. <laughs> I'm gonna throw the first scenario at you, and we're gonna play this kind of like a um, a twenty questions, and we we we're just gonna take you on that whole thought process that me and Mike and the whole uh, basically everybody uh, uses to get into um, their PPE selection. So in this one, we're gonna leave it as very generic. Uh, we're gonna call it a acid spill. That's outside. And, okay, begin. <laughs> and begin and go. All right. Well, so I'm going to ask questions. Is that cool? Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So just like we would ask questions out in the field, I'm going to ask questions. So we have an acid spill and it's it's outside. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask, do, do I have any chance of flammability? Uh, I'm going to say no, there's no chance of, uh, flammability. I'm going to say the chance of flammability is rather low. And okay. how, what, what am I referencing that on? I'm saying that there's a narrow L E L U E L. And I'm also saying that the, uh, flash point is, uh, good for us as far as, uh, the temperature outside. Okay. So he's telling me there's a very narrow, n narrow range here. And I have been on gas leaks outside like not gasoline but high pressure gas leaks that have been spewing out tons and tons of product and we've been right over the leak and we're outside and we're nowhere even near the flammable range mm -hmm. so based upon experience i am pretty comfortable in saying that my bunker gear is going to be out so the very first thing that i'm going to put on is going to probably be my level B protection. Good. Okay. I'm going to throw on a hooded B. I'm going to throw on my SCBA and I'm going to do, I'm going to consider doing a recon. Okay. All right. I'm going to walk up to the product. I'm going to do a 360. I'm going to see what we got going on. And while we're doing that, while we're kind of doing our size up, gathering information and thinking about things, I'm going to have my pH paper with me. Okay. And even though the acid has uh, going to have a low vapor pressure, even though it's not really going to be reactive uh, or it, it very well could be reactive, could be fuming sulfuric acid. Um, but either way, I'm going to let the pH paper tell me what's going on. Okay. I, un I understand the chemical physical properties. I get vapor pressure. I get all that. I understand that there's a potential, but now I'm going to see what's actually there. So I walk up to this spill in my level B's. What is my pH paper doing? Okay, there's a slight breeze going from uh, one side to the other side because it doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, but on the side where the wind's coming from, you have no indication. And as you go around the, the other side, the leeward side, your uh, pH paper does change. Okay, so I have a slightly acidic in environment on the leeward side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, as best as possible, attempt to perform whatever kind of cleanup I have to do with the wind at my back. Exactly. Just as simple as that. There's no acid on the other side. <laughs> right. Because uh, I'm good to go. So I'm going to go with it at my back. But I'm going to always be keeping my pH paper close. Right. Because there have been times that we've started doing cleanups and we have now, you know, kind of stirred things up and it started to react and it started to off gas and we've had to pull out and, and upgrade our gear, mm -hmm. which is totally acceptable there's absolutely no reason why you can't choose one gear and then the situation changes and you pull out and you go oh gotta go to this right 
but that's right. uh, that's basically the scenario because that was exactly how we did it. Yeah. Uh, so let's take Bob. Let's take your same acid spill, okay. and let's now bring it inside. Totally different game now. Totally different game. So go through your thought process. All right. So uh, I'm going to uh, let's just put it on a floor so everybody can kind of what what floor is it on? It's going to be on the first floor. Okay, first floor. Great. Um, my parameters are going to change because in my mind, I'm roughly doubling every hazard I have because now I don't have uh, the – I can't I, – if it's lighter than air, it's not going anywhere. It's capped by the ceiling. If um, that – what the breeze was pushing away is now a concern because it's confined within the room. So first thing I'm going to do is, uh, again, with the pH, uh, my five gas meters – I'm going to start going in and really keeping an eye on my uh, pH paper. I'm going to make entry SCVA and bunker gear. Bunker gear? Yeah. What's your thoughts on the bunker gear? Until I have uh, a, a hit on the uh, the pH, I have no problems with bunker gear right now. That's that's a pretty reasonable choice. You know, there are, and we've we've had this before, we had a nitric acid spill inside. And uh, we went in initially in bunker gear because if you look up your chemical physical properties on nitric acid, when it comes in contact with metal, it gives off a flammable gas. It gives off hydrogen. Right. So that was that's exactly what our thought process was. Okay, so we go inside. You're, you're inside bunker gear. Uh, you've got no hit on your, um, on your, your five star as mm -hmm. far as flammability. Okay. There's nothing going on on, on the PID, okay. and uh, you're, but you're having a relatively quick change of the pH paper. All right, then I'm going to stop there. Uh, I'm probably going to drop something there or indicate it somewhere, somehow, something to say that this is the line that my uh, pH paper changed at, so I can reference it later. OK, uh, maybe I, I'm just going to move a chair or whatever, but I want to mark it. Um, so I'm going to drop back and now I'm going to have to make a consideration. Uh, what I'm going to do is if there's the possibility of me opening windows, maybe from the exterior, possibly even breaking windows. If, if it comes down to it, if you got to do what you got to do, got to do that. And I would also uh, immediately talk to uh, HVAC and the building super to uh, confine or positively access the HVAC systems so that I can know that we're not circulating this stuff now around. Um, but going back to the PPE selection, uh, I'm going to now upgrade. If I'm going into a corrosive atmosphere, I'm going to have to go to a level A because my level B is going to be my splash. Uh, there's no reason to go to C because that's really not going to do any, any good. So I'm concerned now about a vapor uh, atmosphere. So I'm going to have to go to a until I can knock this back down. Sounds. And, and if my ventilation was successful and I make a second entry with bunker gear and I'm closer to actually mitigating it, then I would go again in bunker gear. Yeah. So you, you started off in bunker gear, you upgraded, then you downgraded, right? I could do that. There's no, there's no rules. It's right. Nothing it's says you can't do what we want. We actually this this nitric acid run that that we're speaking of. This is exactly what happened. So we went in. Uh, it was in a room that couldn't be ventilated uh, for you know whatever reason. There was no windows. We went in in bunker gear. There was and actually a little bit different. There was no vapors. So we started off with no vapors and we started off with no flammability. So we said okay. Just to be on the safe side, we're going to throw on our, our Bs, right? Because you're still dealing with it with a, a, a very corrosive acid. And one good whiff of it by accident could, could put you down. So let's do our Bs. We go in with the Bs. We have our pH paper taped to us. As we start cleaning it up, we start agitating it. And now it starts fuming. So our pH paper changed. We pulled out again, switched to our level A. Did the entry in the level A. We got a lot of it cleaned up. By the time the third or fourth entry was going in, there was no more vapors left. So they actually downgraded their suits 
to, I believe, back to a B. They finished the cleanup, got the, the trash and garbage outside, and, and the day was done. But just like Bob said, constantly reevaluating the situation right. and constantly saying, is what I'm wearing best protection both chemically, physically, and stress on my body? I love it. All right. I'm going to throw you another one. All right. Go for it. Chemicals, and it's uh, a completely un un underestimated, I think, out there. Everybody talks about acetylene, but I'm going to talk about ethylene oxide. We have an ethylene oxide release. Ooh. All right. Now, uh, for is, you, you want to give some background on that for, uh, well, for me and anybody who doesn't know about it? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to give you a little, a little skinny on this. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a gas that is usually used in the hospital setting to uh, sterilize um, stuff, you know, like, uh, you know, the, the kits and stuff like that. Uh, it is probably one of the most badass gases I've ever seen. It is, you know, um, acetylene is flammable from 3% to 100%. This is from zero to 100%. It is always flammable and it is unbelievably toxic. Horribly. Uh, toxic enough to be used to disinfect or sterilize hospital equipment. Yeah, it's I, 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 like a drop of this stuff. Uh, it, it kills everything. So uh, it is, I'll give you a reference. Uh, it is a known carcinogen. Uh, the TWA is point less than 0.1 part per million. Wow. Yes. So we're in the parts per billion. We're in the parts per billion range. Uh, the ceiling, the PEL, the, even the IDLH is 800 parts per million, and I wouldn't even get close to that. So pretty bad stuff. We have a uh, – it's going to be a gas or liquid. Uh, de again, depending on the temperature, we're going to say it is uh, a fall day, and we'll say it is a gas because it is 65 degrees, so it is going to be gaseous. So it's going to want to evaporate. Okay, what uh – can I pick this up on any of my meters? You are going to be able to pick this up on, let's see, your IP is 10.56, so you will be successful in that roll of the dice. This is I feel like a dungeon master. Remember that? <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> um, its vapor pressure is 1.46 atmospheres. Wow, so it really it wants, wants to be to a gas. Um you're not going to see it freeze because it's minus 171 degrees. So even in Canada, it will not be ISIS. Um, and it is a flammable gas. So, yeah. What else do you want to know about? I, I got the uh, the NIOSH in front of me. I think that's pretty much it. I mean, if I've got a leak in a room, um, I'm assuming it's a room because yeah. that's – We'll yeah, say I mean, it's a room right now. There you go. Okay. It's a room. Do I have uh, ventilation? Uh, you are in, we'll, we'll say you're in a hospital uh, area. So your l ventilation is extremely limited. Uh, the only way to ventilate is to other parts of the hospital, and that would be unacceptable. Oof. All right. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to try to figure out if there's any way that I can reduce the flammability without spreading it. Okay. And if I can't reduce the flammability without spreading it, I need to figure out a way to minimize the area that's flammable. Okay. Can I give you one more thing that I might have missed on that? Sure. Uh, solubility is missable. Oh, so I can I can knock this down into water. That's that. I just caught that, and I said that would be my move. Okay. Um, so is this is knocking it down into water? Um, is that an, an option when we consider runoff? Like, would this off gas somewhere else if it's running off? That I don't know. Hmm. All right. Well, if I had the ability to contain the the runoff, I may consider knocking it down. Uh, otherwise, I, I depending on the the leak and the amount that's in there. Yeah, it's it's flammable all the time. But if I can limit the flammability to the area not near my body. I may consider a chemical protective clothing. Uh, if I can't, then uh, I may want to consider bunker gear mm -hmm. as a recon to get an idea of what's going on and then possibly having multiple bunker gear entries to limit exposure. Time distance shielding kind of thing, right? Right, kind of like a time distance shielding thing. And then once my flammability was no longer an issue, uh, then I would go into the you know a level A, but constantly be monitoring for flammability.
even so, I mean, I would consider putting on uh, those confined space type uh, fans that have the elephant trunk where I can inject air deep into the room and have it naturally just come out the same door. You know, obviously minimizing the possibility of us having a spark from the fan recirculate and stuff. But like we said before, if we can't change the variability of the toxic versus the flammable, well, we're going to have to do something because right. we can't just walk away from this. Right. Now, luckily, in 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 reality, a lot of these the rooms that these are, are put into have incredibly good ventilation systems in them. Yes. Uh, in, in fact... They are not even part of the HVAC system. They are their own separate uh, ventilation system that produces negative pressure in the room, which means that air will always flow in. And they generally have some ridiculous number of yeah. recycles. It changes like the room's air like uh, once every 30 seconds, the complete room air once every 30 seconds. Right. So find out if you're ever in a situation where they're storing chemicals or you're in a lab find out from the, the lab managers, hey, where does this stuff ventilate to? Because this isn't part of the normal HVAC. Can I use this as part of my as part of my ventilation? Maybe I could take what's leaking and quickly bring it over there. And now I've got it even closer to the ventilation system. So right. nothing says you can't move things around a little bit. Uh, it, you know, if you have that opportunity, consider it and think about it. Let's huh? move on, Bob, to yes. a chlorine leak, chlorine gas leak. All right, I'll just put it in the pool. Done. Thank you. Done. <laughs> Different like that. It's Miller time. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Different chlorine. Oh my God, the Miller time. I <laughs> we were we were in front of a uh, a camp yesterday, yeah. right? For the the camp with the high school kids. Right. And I laughed so hard when you were like, "We'll just bang that out," and then boom, it's Miller time, and absolutely like. <laughs> And these were like these were geek kids. Like these were kids that 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 wouldn't know what Miller time went. And there was just like silence. 50 sets of eyeballs just kind of like, what the hell's Miller time? What does he mean yeah. by Miller time? It feels like a family party. <laughs> it was great. All right. So no, I got a chlorine leak. Chlorine gas. Yeah. Right, chlorine do I have gas or do I have a liquid? You have gas. Oh, that makes it a little difficult. All right. So uh, let's see. I have a chlorine. Is it inside or outside? It's going to be inside. Okay. Chlorine gas inside. What's my ventilation profile? Is it good? Um, unknown. All right. I can't tell. All right. So right off the bat, I'm going to go with my uh, SCBA bunker gear, and I'm going to have my pH. I'm going to have my single gas or whatever chlorine meter I might have, and if I don't have that, I'll use my colometric tubes, whatever means I have of knowing about chlorine. Um, to go in there. What happens when I go in there? Okay. Uh, I guess we could go through two different scenarios. You walk in and immediately you see the emergency ventilation button that allows you, that allows the emergency vents to kick in. I wouldn't hit it yet. Okay. I'm uh, not so as you go further in, you're seeing pH changes and high levels of uh, of chlorine in the 50 to 60 parts per million. All right. Then I'm going to back out, and I'm going to consult with the people that uh, run the building and see if that would indeed do what I want it to do. What are you yeah. looking for it to do? I want it to change the air. Okay. I can drop the concentration of air that has chlorine in it safely. Then I'm going to do that. Because I'm not really worried about flammability. Chlorine is not flammable, but it's a super strong oxidizer. So, you know, the, if if the billing owners say, "Yeah, it'll do it," but and I don't, I'm not going to let them know that it's going to basically rot their whole system out <laughs> you know, as soon as they hit it on, because they're going to be like, "Ah, I don't want to pay for that." So, if it's going to do what I need to do, then I'm going to push the button. Uh, so I will utilize. Let's say I utilize it. Okay, you, you utilize it. Uh, as you walk back in, you're getting negligible. Yeah. You're changing it out. You're getting negligible. Uh, you walk up, it's a chlorine, a cylinder, really, really, really tiny leak in the, uh, in one of the fittings. Am I, am I close enough to mitigate? 
you are close enough at this point to mitigate. All right. Do I have uh, a significant amount of pH change on my strips or the CL meter? No, almost nothing. Then I'm just going to go with the uh, the the A kit if it can't be just packing nuts or whatever the basic mitigation of the valving might be. If I could just shut the headless, try before you pry. I might just turn the valve. Turn the valve, shuts down. Done. Then we're just going to change the air until everything brings down to zero. And uh, again, it's middle of time. All right, good to go. Now this could be this would be totally different if the leak was something that was substantial, right? Where that that ventilation system not that it changed it out in the air but you know you you could very well change out the air within that system but then you get close enough to that cylinder where no matter how much you're going to ventilate you're still going to be in a cloud of chlorine right and at that point that's where i thought you were going to go with it see if that was the case and i was getting still positive uh you know and again when, when i say we're leaving we're going to freshen up all of our ph strips and i'm going to go in again and I don't bring in more than like four or five of them because if you go in with the whole box in your pocket, what happens to the box in your pocket? It all changes. It all changes, right? You get a thousand strips that say acid. Right, acid. So I'm, gonna, I'm only going to take in a couple and maybe one I'll lead with it in my hand outstretched in front of me so that I can get the first indication in front of my face. And if it is still hitting it, then I'm going to drop back and we're going to go level A because it's a gaseous cloud that's a uh, an oxidizer. I can't screw around with this. I got to go into the the level A suit. B is not going to work. It's not a liquid, uh, or, or it's going to be negligible. So just go to the level A. Sounds good to me. All right. Well, that was, that was any uh, any questions out there in Radio Land? No, no, nobody's got anything. All right. <laughs> I think that wraps up another episode of the Hazmat Guys. Thank you for taking a little bit of your day to listen to us, and uh, hopefully we made your job just a little bit easier. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at the Hazmat Guys, and please take a moment to go to iTunes and put in a review of our podcast, or you can call our new common hotline at 843-628-1484. That's 843-6-THE-MAT. And we are now recording the show and producing a live, unedited version, so you get to see what jackass as we actually are uh you can watch this on youtube it's going to be posted on youtube uh you can also watch the show live uh if you go to google plus sign up to follow us and you'll be notified when the show starts if that's what you want to do jump on and watch us and we always look forward to your feedback or information or, in or interesting incidents if that what you are a part of so send us a note at feedback at the hazmat guys .com. guys don't just get on the job Get into the job. For the love of God. <laughs> Take care, Bob. All right. And I stop recording. No. We already marked. We what's up? Oh yeah, I forgot we got the oh crap. Yeah, right. we did no, we did an hour and twelve. I know. Two episodes. Oh yeah, right. I'm gonna break that up. Yeah. Wait a second. That means I gotta change the nugget location. Uh, all right, so we're gonna have to do two nuggets. So stop yours, okay? And now we're gonna do the nuggets. So I have one already pulled out. Uh, where the fuck was it? All right, you know what? Start recording again. I'm stopping the recording, the broadcast. <laughs>